Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Serious Security Seminar at Purdue University. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Sam King. Uh, Sam is an assistant professor of computer science from our uh, neighboring institution, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, he received his uh, PhD in computer science from University of Michigan in 2006. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sam's research interests are in security, uh, experimental system design, and computer system in general. And today he'll talk about uh, two topics uh, in these areas. Thanks, Inkui. So hello, my name is Sam King, and I'll, today I'll be talking about two main topics. The first one is we'll be discussing how to build uh, more secure browsers and more secure operating systems. And in the sep second topic, we'll be discussing uh, malicious hardware and how we can potentially defend against this, this emerging threat. So before I dive in and talk about technical topics, I wanted to uh, just show some of the students who, who worked on these projects. And so the first one shown here is, is Shro Tang, and he's also known as Maverick. So for any of you in, in your 30s and, and maybe saw a few movies, you understand the reference. But he's really the main guy behind a lot of the browser stuff I'll be talking about today. Now, a few of the other students are Hao Hui Mai. He's, he's also known as the enforcer. So if, if I get any questions I don't like, usually I send Hao Hui after you, but uh, he's not here with me today. Um, we also have Matt Hicks, who's also known as the mailman. Uh, that, that's more of a reference to the way he plays basketball than anything technical. And uh, he's the main student behind the hardware stuff I'll be talking about. So as a general overview, first I'll discuss web browsers, and I'll spend about two-thirds of my time talking about web browsers, and then I'll spend the last one-third talking about defending against malicious hardware. And if you do have any questions along the way, please feel free to interrupt me. So if you look at how the web has evolved over the last few years, it's transformed from a fairly basic system where you have the web browser, and the web browser is your main application. And the browser is used to, to view static HTML data. Well, recently, uh, web pages have really transformed into web-based applications. And your browser has transformed into a platform for managing these web-based applications. So from a usability perspective, this has been great. We've had a number of different new applications like Facebook. You can conduct banking online, check your email, play games, watch TV, and all of the number of things that you're able to do with the web have, have been made possible by this evolution. But the downside is with this evolution has come complexity. And there's a lot of evidence that browsers and web systems are the number one, atta number one target for attackers of computer systems. So if we look at attacks on web-based systems, they, uh, they can occur at many different layers of your computer system. So up to the top layer, you have an attack on a web-based application, which could be something like a cross-site scripting attack. And cross-site scripting attacks are kind of like bee stings, right? So, so cross-site scripting and other web-based vulnerabilities are, are very common. In fact, they're the most common type of vulnerability on the planet. But for the most part, it might hurt a little bit, but it really doesn't do any damage. You know, maybe there are a few people who are allergic to bees, or maybe you have a cross-site scripting vulnerability on Facebook. You know, this is the type of thing that can potentially be damaging. But, you know, if you have a cross-site scripting vulnerability on ESPN.com, for example, it's effectively meaningless. So it's very common, but not quite so potent. Now, moving one layer down on the computer stack, we have vulnerabilities to the web browser. And these are kind of like snake bites. So snake bites are less common than bee stings, but they still happen. So for example, I've been bit by a snake before. And it tends to be the type of thing you remember. Um, and they're much more damaging. Where if an attacker is able to take over your browser, they can access all of your web data, and they can also have um, avenues into the computer system itself. Now we're going one step further down the stack. If we look at vulnerabilities to operating systems and libraries, these are kind of like shark bites. And when you have a, a vulnerability in your operating system that somebody compromises, uh, they've basically taken over your system. It tends to be the type, well, you don't actually remember a shark bite because you're, you're pretty much not there anymore. And if you take a step back and look at this from a, from a more conceptual layer, I would say that this is really a, a question of, of layers of your computer system. So the lower you go on your computer system, the more control you'll have. 
And the more control as an attacker, the more things you can do. So down at the lowest layers of your computer systems, there's really arbitrary things you can do. Now, all of these different types of attacks are important for us to study. And I've, I've published papers in each of these different topics. But today, we're going to focus on the two lower layers, browser vulnerabilities and OS vulnerabilities. So if you look at how some browsers are built, they are what I consider a monolithic web browser. And so what this means is it takes all of your content and it jams it into the same protection domain. So shown here on this slide, we have um, uh, what, what's Firefox running on top of Windows. And so, you know, what's shown in red here are things that are part of your trusted computing base. And the trusted computing base means that if you get an attack in one of these parts of, of, your, of your software or your computer system, then the attacker can, can compromise the security of your system. So in Firefox, they'll have a bunch of if statements to try to keep web pages isolated. But for the most part, if somebody gets into to Firefox, they're going to have complete control of everything that's going on. Now, because of this, researchers, including myself, have proposed newer browser architectures where you can use something called a, a browser kernel that essentially decomposes the browser into a number of much smaller subsystems and provides a clean separation between the security logic of the browser and the implementation of the browser itself. Um, one example of this that you may have heard of is, is Google Chrome web browser. It does something kind of similar to this. Um, and it's great because you can, if, you're, if your web app gets broken into, then you can still have pretty high assurance that it's going to be isolated. But one of the problems with this, these basic architectures is that they still have huge amounts of code that are part of their trusted computing base. So you'll note here on this figure, we have an entire operating system, 10 million lines of code, that's all fundamentally being trusted for the security of your system. Um, now, one might argue, well, we can use a microkernel-like system to try to, to isolate components. And certainly, you can isolate traditional OS components using something like a microkernel, but it still doesn't get you far enough because all of these components are shared. So if you have an application and it needs to open a socket, it's going to go through your TCP IP server. If your TCP IP server gets broken into, any application that communicates with it is going to be, uh, is going to be susceptible to attack. So even though there's isolation, you still have to trust these components to do what they're supposed to do. So what we've done is we've built a new operating system and we focus on trying to make this one application, the web browser, more secure. And essentially what we've done is made browser abstractions first class OS abstractions. And I'll talk about that a lot later today. But we've made browser abstractions first class OS abstractions and lifted all these components up and have software for monitoring the interactions between them. And so with this in place, we can have very high assurance that even if these components get broken into, we can still browse the web safely. So as a general overview for the browser part of the talk, first I'll spend a little bit of time discussing the overall IBOS architecture. Then I'll describe our low-level mechanism for enforcing security policies called a security invariant. I'll talk about how we apply security invariants to a few of the subsystems within IBOS. And then I'll describe our evaluation before I conclude. So shown here is the overall IBOS architecture. Now down at the bottom, you can see the IBOS kernel and the hardware, and these are both in red. And these are used to signify um, components that are part of our trusted computing base. Now up at the top, we have something called a web page instance. And the web page instance is really one of our main principles here in our browser operating system. So it's kind of like a process. Now each time you click on a link, or you type a new URL into your URL bar, uh, and you visit a new web page, you're going to create a new web page instance. Now, in order for this web page instance to do the things that browsers normally do, it communicates with a number of browser abstraction servers to, to handle things like user interface storage and, and network handling. And the key thing I'd like to point out here is that all the components running above your IBOS kernel, including your window manager and your device drivers, um, these are all outside of our trusted computing base. Now, the fundamental thing that makes IBOS different is that the IBOS kernel knows about browser level abstractions. So something like a tab, like an HTTP request, a cookie, these are all first class abstractions in our browser operating system. And by doing this, we can make things much, much simpler. And so our goal is 
you know, even if, for example, your network process or your, your network driver has been completely compromised, you should still be able to visit, visit Facebook and do so without uh, risking the confidentiality and integrity of your session. So the next concept I'm going to discuss is, is a security invariant. Now this general idea of an invariant is something that's been used in many different areas of computer science and, and in fact beyond. So programming languages people have their notion of invariance, operating systems have their notions of invariance, formal methods and so on and so forth. And so I'll introduce yet another invariant which is a security invariant. Now to help motivate what a security invariant is, I've got a real world example. So a real world example of an invariant could be that you see fireworks on the 4th of July. Okay, so if you see fireworks you know that everything's okay. Um, now it doesn't matter how those fireworks end up getting in the sky. It could be a kid with a match lighting, lighting off fireworks, or it could be a, a sophisticated computer controlled coordinated fireworks show, or maybe as shown here on this figure, this, this Google Doodle, you have a Rube Goldberg machine where you have to kick a football and a bird eventually um, leads to an iron lighting the, the firework. Independent of how the firework ends up getting in the sky, as long as you see fireworks up in the sky on the 4th of July, you know that everything's okay. So the key thing we want to do is we want to apply this basic principle to our browser operating system. So what this means is we want to be able to check key security properties of each of the different components of our system without having to understand exactly how they're implemented. Now the key challenge in being able to do this and being able to apply security invariants to our system is figuring out how to decompose and architect our system in a way that we expose the right abstractions for us to be able to enforce high-level browser security policies using security invariants. Now before I talk too much more about the security invariants, um, I did want to introduce the IBOSS label. And this is the key entity by which all of our security decisions are predicated. And for IBOSS labels, they're made up of the uh, origin of an HTTP request. And this is consistent with current browser security policies. So what this means is it's the protocol domain port tuple of a, of a URL uh, makes up a label. And one of the interesting things we do with IBOSS is we infer labels automatically instead of having application specify labels like you would in an information flow system. Uh, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about the, the details of this inference. So shown here on this slide is two web page instances for two separate web pages that a user might want to visit. One is for google.com and the other one is for cs.uiuc.edu. Now what iBoss is going to do is it's going to create two different uh, web page instances to handle these, these uh, web requests. And what it will do is it will parse out the label from the request and it will, the kernel will automatically apply this label to each of these web page instances. So Google will get a Google based label and then UIUC will get a UIUC based one. And then once these labels are in place, all of our security decisions are predicated uh, off of that. Now, once the web page starts loading, it's going to make a number of network requests. Now, the Google web page is going to visit google.com to get main HTML, maybe it grabs a few ads. Likewise, with UIUC is going to go to cs.uiuc to also grab the main HTML. And so one of the things that we did with iBoss is we wanted to separate out the, the handling of network from the web page instance itself. So if you'll notice on the right, you can see that some of these network processes are given different labels depending upon which, um, where the, the request was made to. And so what this does is it provides a clean separation for us to apply different policies to network processes than we would to web page instances. And it does it in a way so that these entities are all visible to our kernel. So it's our underlying kernel that's making these basic security decisions. Now, for network requests in general, there's some details that I've omitted here. There are things we do on the return path. There are things we do to make sure that ads.com is separate for UIUC and Google. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm, I'm not going to discuss any of that. So you know, one of the key things that's, that's important about our overall architecture is being able to deal with device drivers. Now, device drivers are tricky because they're fundamentally shared by all of your applications. Now remember, we want somebody to be able to break into your network interface driver and still uh, be able to send network packets without, without risking the confidentiality and integrity of your data. And the key mechanism we use 
to, to um, supply this type of functionality is we have a split driver architecture where we provide a separation between the device logic and the programming of the underlying device and the management of DMA buffers. So to give you a more concrete example about, about what this means, I've got an example shown here for sending an Ethernet, a, a series of Ethernet frames across the network. So shown here on this slide, we have a network process that's, that's being, been labeled with ads.com and, and should make requests to ads.com. Then we've got a NIC driver on the right, which handles the programming of the underlying driver, and then the IBOS kernel, which manages DMA buffers. So what will happen is if somebody makes a network request to ads.com, the network process will take this, it will form an HTTP request, and then form TCP frames and form IP frames until it finally gets to a set of Ethernet frames that it then sends down to the IBOS kernel. Now what the IBOS kernel will do is it will inspect these Ethernet frames and TCP and IP frames and it will check to make sure that the TCP port for these particular frames are equal to, to ads.com and that the IP address is also equal to, to ads.com. So by doing this, we know that these, these low-level network requests are headed to the correct place given how the network process has been labeled. Now once the IBOS kernel vets the data, it will copy it into a, into a DMA buffer. And once it's copied it into a DMA buffer, it notifies the NIC driver about the address of the DMA buffer. Now one important distinction here is that the NIC driver doesn't actually have a pointer to the DMA buffer. Now it knows the physical address where the DMA buffer starts, and it can program the underlying device with this physical address, but it never actually has a pointer to the DMA buffer. So this is why even if your NIC driver is completely compromised, we know that it can't modify any of your DMA data. So the final check we have is after the NIC driver has received this, this notification about a new uh, transmit buffer, it will program the underlying card to send this out across the wire. So the final check we have is a very small device specific state machine that runs inside our IBOS kernel that validates in fact the sequence of in and out instructions is setting a transmit buffer and it is setting it to a pre-validated DMA buffer. So taking a step back what I've shown here are a number of small checks that we provide along this path that give us the high level assurance that, to know that if we have a network process and it's able to send data out across the network, it's consistent with our browser security policy. And so this is how we use uh, security invariants for device drivers. Now another aspect of this project that we spent time looking at was the window management side of it. And this is a part that's often ignored by, by many researchers, but we thought for having a practical application like a web browser, um, dealing with window management um, and, and video drivers was something that was, that was hugely important. So shown here on this slide, we have the basic flow for what's called a frame buffer video driver. And the way a frame buffer video driver works is that you have a big chunk of memory and you write pixel values into this big chunk of memory. The video card then reads these pixel values in and displays the pixel values on your monitor. This is a pretty basic way to uh, set up a video driver. But the key advantage it gives us with iBoss is that it enables us to use page level protections to provide some display isolation for, for what gets displayed on the screen itself. So, shown here is a screenshot of iBoss. So, just as a, as a quick aside, um, when Schwo gives this talk, he actually gives it live on iBoss. So, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, I've already done my, my Purdue demo. So, last time I was here and gave a talk, I installed a virtual machine-based rootkit on my laptop and finished up the talk. So, I'm, I'm demoed out here at, at, at Purdue. Um, so, you guys just get the, the bitmap shot here from, uh, from, from what I grabbed from Schwo. But... Shown here is a screenshot from, from iBoss. Now first I'd like to direct your attention to the top of the screen. And there, it's kind of hard to see, but we've reserved a, a, a very small portion of the screen specifically for the kernel. So what we can do is with the kernel, we can display the URL of the current uh, web page that's, that's being, that's being v displayed. So it gives at least a very small visual cue as to what's going on. 
Now, one level down from this, you can see the buttons and bookmarks that are, that are part of a global state for the browser, which is commonly referred to as the browser Chrome. And this also is, uh, you know, given the, the basic information that, that uh, you need to navigate through your browser. And then finally, down at the bottom, we have the content that's being displayed by a web page instance itself. Now, the key thing that's important about this particular slide is that each of these components are isolated from each other. All right? So if you have an attacker and they break in to your web page instance, they can't overwrite your Chrome and they can't overwrite into the kernel area. And that's because we're using page level protect protections and, and security invariants to, to make sure that this doesn't happen. Likewise, if somebody breaks into our window manager or into our Chrome manager, then they can't overwrite the content that's in the web page. And then finally, we've got a little bit of redundant information up at the top that's from the kernel, and we're trusting. So because we're using page protections, we're able to isolate these different components from each other, even if they're completely compromised by an attacker. Now, in addition to isolating portions of the screen, we also use page protections to isolate different tabs from each other. So as I mentioned before, a tab is a fundamental abstraction in our system. So we know the current tab, and we can make sure that only the current tab has access to the screen, and, um, <coughs> and only the current tab can receive mouse and keyboard events. And we can do this um, through, through the series of checks inside our kernel. Now, in addition to uh, the, the basic uh, UI, we do have some support for basic storage architecture, but I'm not going to talk about it in too much detail. Um, basically, what our storage system does is it stores key value data, data pairs for, uh, for doing things like cookies and HTML5 local storage. Now, the thing that's a little bit interesting about it is that the IBOSS kernel will encrypt any of this data before it stores it. So that's why we don't have any security invariants for our storage subsystem. We just use encryption and we don't worry about it. Now, it's true that we could potentially get some, some data deleted, but at the very least, we'll, we'll have the confidentiality and integrity of that data will be assured. Um, but I won't talk too much about that. Now, in our current implementation, we use L4 Pistachio as a starting point, and we use the MMU abstractions and message passing interfaces provided by that, and we build up our overall IBOSS kernel using this as a, as a starting point. We have E1000 Ethernet drivers, mouse and keyboard drivers, and a frame buffer video driver that uses QT software rastering, uh, rastering system, which turns out is actually quite efficient. Uh, we also use WebKit for parsing and rendering HTML and, and handling JavaScript, and we use the QT port of WebKit. Um, now, something I didn't talk about at all today was that we also have support for traditional applications. And I think the key idea here is that you can build traditional applications on top of the abstractions provided for the browser. So basically, you can build up general purpose browser, general purpose OS abstractions on top of browser abstractions. Now, we have only a few simple um, traditional applications so far. Mainly, we have the C runtime and Qt libraries ported, so anything that uses those should work in our system. But we do have a PDF viewer as well. And we ran experiments on the Intel Core Quad CPU running at 2.33 gigahertz and 4 gigabytes of RAM. So to evaluate our browser, if you remember, our, our high-level goal is to design a new operating system to make web browsers more secure. Um, so what we're assuming is that attackers can execute arbitrary instructions within each of the components of our system, and we're only going to worry about confidential, confidentiality and integrity. So attacks like denial of service are still very viable in IBOSS. Now, I think we might be able to help with those, but it's not something we've looked at thus far. So we're focusing on confidentiality and integrity. So the first experiment that I wanted to show is counting the lines of code within the trusted computing base. Now, you know, using lines of code is a, is a hard metric for security is, is you know, dubious at best. But at the very least, it gives you some rough ideas about the, the level of complexity that we're talking about. So shown here at the top of our TCB count, we have Firefox running on Linux. And using a very conservative count of lines of code, we came up with about 5.6 million lines of code inside your trusted computing base. 
So 5.6 million lines of code are what you're relying on every time you visit your, your bank. And this is just a huge amount of software. Now Chrome OS is a project from Google that has some similar goals to ours, um, but one of the things that they do is they use a commodity Linux kernel as their underlying uh, platform. And they come up with about 4.4 million lines of code in their trusted computing base. Now, IBOS, on the, con on, on the other hand, has 42,000 lines of code in the trusted computing base. So you can see we've got a, a few orders of magnitude difference here and the levels of complexity. So when you're over a million, it's really difficult for one single person to sit down and understand your code base. And things like formal methods are really, really debugging tools at best. Whereas when you're down around 42,000 lines of code, this is something that certainly one person can, can definitely understand. And things like formal methods come into play. Now we haven't done that yet, but it's, it's, it's uh, you know, something that I think becomes a possibility when you've got this level of complexity versus the 4.4 million or 5.6 million. Now the next thing we evaluated was we went through recent uh, bug reports of vulnerabilities that happen in operating systems and libraries and we tried to classify if IBOS would be susceptible to them. So um, of the 28 vulnerabilities that we looked at from 2010, and this, this runs through September, um, we, we, IVOS would have pre prevented 27 of those. Now the interesting part is that there is one that IBOS would have, would have not been able to handle. And so it turns out the E1000 driver, the driver we used, had a, had a small bug in the way that it counted um, offsets for transmit buffers. And so essentially this is kind of the same logic that we would have needed as part of our validation check. So in general, if device drivers um, are compromised. This is something that IBOS handles well, but it does turn out that there is some device specific code that, that runs in IBOS and so there was one, particular, one bug that, that I think we probably would have been susceptible to. Now in addition, you know, the, the main point of IBOS is to try to um, you know, shore up these low level libraries, but we also do improve browser security as well. So what we did is looked at 175 security vulnerabilities from the, from the Google Chrome uh, bug list and we compared you know how well Google Chrome contained them versus how well IBOS contained or prevented them and, and the reason we wanted to look at Chrome is because um, our opinion is for for the commercial browsers that are out there Chrome is probably has the best architecture for security so we wanted to see if our architecture for our browser could improve on that so up at the top we have a category that we call memory exploitation so this basically means you've got a buffer overflow and we're going to assume that attackers can execute arbitrary instructions. Now, as you can see, Chrome actually does pretty well here. Of the 82 bugs that were in this category, Chrome would have handled 71, about 86%. And this is kind of the vulnerability. This is not that surprising because this is the main reason why Chrome was designed. You know, one of the key security benefits that they're providing is this type of isolation. However, there were still 11 of these vulnerabilities that were inside their, their browser kernel that they wouldn't have overcome. Now, IBOS, on the other hand, gets uh, 76 of those, so it, it, does, it does slightly better. Now, the other thing that I wanted to point out is sandbox bypassing. So when you have a modern system, sandboxing is essentially a way of taking overly permissive or unused interfaces on your operating system and restricting them down. SE Linux is a great example of a, of a sandboxing system. Um, it turns out writing sandboxing policies and implementing sandboxing mechanisms is actually pretty difficult. And so there were 12 bugs that, that, that Chrome had um, revolved around those. And, and obviously any time that, that you can break out of the sandbox, um, the Chrome's not going to contain it. But in all of these particular cases, this is something that IBOS would have handled because it's just you know, a, a fundamental part. Of our, of our overall design. Now in addition to uh, assessing security, we also measured performance. And the way we measure performance is by measuring page load latency time. Now a page load latency time is measured as the time it takes from when you click go until when the onload event fires inside your browser. Now on the y-axis shown here, we have page load latency time shown in milliseconds. And on the x-axis, we have the six different websites that we tested where we looked at Google Maps, Bing, Craigslist, CSET Illinois, Wikipedia, and Facebook. Now we tested out four different browsers to see, um, to, to try to assess the, overhaul, the overhead of iBoss. So we looked at iBoss, we looked at iBoss Linux, 
where we effectively took the iBoss browser and we ported it to Linux. We looked at Firefox running on Linux and, and Chrome running on Linux. And so, you know, overall, the, the high-level picture, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but the high-level picture is, you know, iBoss basically performs roughly as, 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 as well as the other browsers. But the one result I wanted to point out here was CS at Illinois. So if you look here, um, iBoss is the slowest browser for CS Illinois. This is kind of embarrassing. You know, all of these guys beat us on our own website. So I guarantee, if you guys see me give this talk again, next time we'll have the fastest one, for at least for CS at Illinois. Like, I don't care if I have to change the website or hard code stuff into our browser. Like, we're not going to lose to Chrome on our own website. So to conclude, but just a quick reminder, I've also got hardware stuff I'm talking about next. So to conclude the browser portion of the talk, um, the key thing that I showed here is if you make browser abstractions first class OS abstractions, it gives you a much better starting point for building a, an operating system that can support browsers with high assurance. Now, what we've shown is that by doing this, we can reduce our trusted computing base by several orders of magnitude. It's a much, much simpler system with a much smaller layer of software that you have to trust. And if the components are broken into, we have enough checks to make sure that, the, that these, these components are contained from the rest of the system. And overall, even if you have you know, components that are fully compromised on your system, you should still be able to visit trusted websites safely. So if there are any questions on the browser part of it, now would be the time before I move on to hardware. Yeah? So you mentioned your trusting computing base for iBoss is like 44 Sundland Sundland code. Yeah, so totally does typical. that include the device driver code? No. So it includes a very small state machine for our device drivers, but most of the device driver logic is, is outside of it. And that's because for each of the device drivers we have, we have an appropriate set of, of security invariants that we use to make sure that even if they're compromised, they're still doing what, roughly what they should be doing. Yeah. Is there a trade-off to have a small iBoss kernel as opposed to like these bigger kernels? Some yes. kind of trade-off. So there is a trade-off. Um, so to be fair, we haven't completely evaluated this, but I mean the the real trade-off here is for applications that aren't part of your browser. They're probably going to be slower than than um, applications that are tuned for Linux. So for example, you know we've got these browser abstractions, and then for a traditional application like you know I don't know whatever your, your word processor that's running on your computer. You've got a layer to build up general OS abstractions on top of that, and then you've got your basic, um, your basic uh, word processor. I'm assuming that's going to be slower. There are no security trade-offs. So you have the same security properties with, with your word processor that you have running on Windows 7 or Mac OS or, or you know, any of these systems. Um, but at the very least, for, for iBoss, you have higher security. Um, but the trade-off, my guess, is probably going to be performance. We don't know if it's fundamental or not, but... Would it make sense to do all the stuff that you're doing with iBoss at the Linux kernel layer? So not just web browsers, but also other no, applications? that wouldn't make sense. So I think uh, the Linux kernel is, you know, it's, it's a great piece of software. Like, I wrote my dissertation on it, but it's, it's, it's big. And there's a lot of code, and there are a lot of security vulnerabilities that happen in the Linux kernel. And so, no, I, I don't think it makes sense at all. Okay, so now we're moving on to hardware. So just to refresh your memory, remember at the beginning of talk, I was up here and I waved my hands a little bit about these, these layers of attacks, and we had the, the shark bite was, was the baddest one of, of all of these. This was the lowest layer. So in the last part of the talk, we're going to discuss the killer whale of, of attacks. So this is the lowest layer, hardware. You know, what happens if people can break into your hardware? It gets kind of, uh, kind of crazy, but we've got some solutions that we think will uh, hopefully improve. And so for those of you who can't really see it, we've got a very naive looking shark, that, shark that's about to get eaten by a very large killer whale. So whenever we build secure systems, we build these overall secure systems starting with a set of assumptions. Now given these assumptions, we build up our overall secure system. Consequently, one very good way to break a secure system is to violate these assumptions. So for example, if I were to break a crypto system, I wouldn't attack the mathematical underpinnings of the cryptography 
Instead, what I would do is look for the crypto keys in memory. Or maybe I would tweak the random number generator, make it a little bit less random. And by violating the assumptions upon which the crypto system was built, you can then break the security of the system. Now, one, what I would argue, one fairly fundamental assumption that, that most systems make is that the underlying hardware is correct. And so the question that we want to ask is what happens when you can no longer make this assumption? Now, one observation is that hardware is every bit as complex as software. Now, you know, a lot of people think that software is more complex and it's not tested very well. But as it turns out, um, if you look at, for example, the SunSpark Niagara 2 processor, this is one, you know, a relatively simple processor, especially when compared to what Intel puts out. It has over a million lines of code in its VHDL design. So this is a pretty complex artifact, um, every bit as complex as an OS kernel. Now, also, it is true that hardware uses testing and formal methods, but the Intel Core 2 Duo has had an average of three bugs per month in deployed hardware. And I would be willing to bet that that's probably more than, than the number of bugs people have found in the Windows kernel. So hardware is complex, and there's a real opportunity for hardware to become a vehicle for malice, just like software is today. So one of the first things that I'm going to talk about just very briefly is a project called the Illinois Malicious Processor Project, or the IMP. And what we showed is that it's possible to modify the design of a processor to implement very practical attacks. And really the key insight is that you can build a small piece of, of, of hardware that helps um, f serve as a foothold for your overall system level attack. Now, as, as anyone who's taken an undergraduate hardware class knows, implementing hardware is difficult. In fact, according to Todd Austin, this is why they call it hardware. But as it turns out, implementing hardware-based attacks is actually quite easy. So the key here is that there are a number of pretty useful circuits running around something like a CPU. In fact, it's got a really efficient Turing machine sitting right there. So the key is to try to reuse the existing circuits that are already part of the design. So you can add a few little bits of logic here and there to your system, and you can implement very high-level, high-value attacks without adding huge amounts of code. Now, as I mentioned, I'm not going to talk about the details of the, of the IMP project, but we did implement a number of, of malicious processors several years ago, and it served as a good learning experience for thinking about the defense, which is the, really the ultimate goal here. So the, the second part, the part which I'll focus the remainder of my talk on, is a project called Blue Chip. And with Blue Chip, what we want to do is detect potentially malicious circuits automatically and remove them from the design. So when we look at the design of a, of a piece of hardware, at some point there's going to be a designer that will write a bunch of VHDL or Verilog code and, and design the overall hardware. And at some point, you could have another designer that either intentionally or unintentionally adds an attack to the underlying hardware, or to the design of the hardware. So the first part of, of our system is called UCI. And UCI is a design time algorithm that runs through the hardware design to try to find any circuits that might be part of an attack, which we call suspicious circuits. Now, once we've identified potentially suspicious circuits, comes the second part of the system, our, our runtime system, called blue chip, which will essentially remove these circuits from the design itself and then add some runtime fix-up hardware and software so that you can do this safely and still usually make forward progress. So first, I'm going to discuss some of the details of, of, our, of our algorithm for detecting malicious hardware called UCI. So shown here on this figure, we have um, at the top an uncontaminated circuit, just a normal hardware design. And you can see there's a signal coming out of that called priv, which is the privilege bit of the <coughs> CPU. Now there's some malicious logic that's attached to a MUX that when it's, when it's um, asserted, it will pin the priv signal equal to one, essentially giving the attacker um, supervisor mode privileges on the CPU. Now, one of the key insights of UCI is that the attacker is unlikely to trigger this attack during testing. So if you were running through a hardware design verification test and you were to trigger this attack, then you would see automatically, oh, my privilege bit is set equal to one when it shouldn't be, something's going on. So we're going to assume that the attacker is going to avoid doing that, and it's actually pretty easy to do. But we want to try to use this against the attacker. So the way our algorithm works is it runs through all the design verification tests 
and it tries to find sets of signals where the values are always equal. So what this means is that for this particular set of test cases, you can essentially draw a, create a wire between these two signals. Okay, So you can put a wire between these two signals, and for these test cases, it will have identical behavior to what it would have had otherwise. And in, a, in essence, by doing this, we've then removed other parts from the design, or we've highlighted parts of the circuit. And in this particular example, we've highlighted all of the circuits that were part of the malicious aspect of the, of the design. So the fundamental question here is once we've identified these circuits that are potentially malicious or suspicious circuits, what do we do? So our idea is we remove them from the design. We just take them out uh, of, the, of the source code. So we'll modify the source code and uh, effectively remove it. Now, there becomes a dilemma here where if we remove unused circuit, if we remove these circuits from the design and the circuits were part of an attack, everything's fine. We've just taken an attack out of the hardware. But the problem is if the circuits are legitimate, now, if they would have been activated during the running of the hardware, we could potentially run into problems. And that's where the second part of, of the system comes in, blue chip. So what we do from the hardware perspective for blue chip is we add some logic to the circuit itself to try to detect if this circuit would have ever been activated. So if the circuit that we effectively removed would have been activated, essentially what we do is, is flush the state of the, of the hardware and we throw an exception up to software. Now what the software will do is run as an emulation routine that, that handles this exception inside the operating system. And essentially what the software will do is it will then emulate the computation in software to essentially scoop by that piece of hardware that, that you removed. Now, I do apologize in advance for this obnoxious slide, but this is one point that like everyone misses. So if you're checking your email and you've been paying attention at all for the second part, like this is the one thing that I want you to get out of it. Blue chip does not emulate the underlying hardware. Okay? So it doesn't emulate the low-level registers and logic gates that we've that we've affected. Instead, what blue chip does is it emulates the hardware at a much higher level of abstraction. So for a processor, what this means is we've modified some gates and muxes and, and these low-level hardware abstractions. But when we do emulation, we're doing instruction by instruction emulation, operating at a much, much higher level of abstraction. Furthermore, modern processors have enough redundancy in them that we can slightly perturb the computation in a way that we essentially route around the hardware we've, re we've removed. So for example, let's say that we remove the OR instruction from the instruction set and we get an exception. We can use NAND instructions to emulate uh, the effects of an OR. So in effect, in software, we can emulate around that hardware that's been removed. Now, if you don't understand the details of it, that's okay, don't worry. Um, but I will send you a pointer to, to our paper. Um, so for the topics I discussed today, there, there are really four key papers that you could look at, and potentially more. Um, you can go to my homepage, Sam King, if, 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 you're, if you're interested. Um, the first one is the OP web browser. And this was really the, the first project in the browser line of work where we were the first ones to take a look at decomposing the browser into a number of smaller subsystems. Um, and it's a design that predates uh, Google Chrome. Uh, this work was done with, with one of my former PhD students, Chris Greer. Now IBOSS uh, was the work that I talked about for the most part in the beginning of the talk. And this is from OSDI 2010. And this was done with the students that I've, that I've already introduced. For hardware, there was a paper on how we built malicious hardware, and it showed up in Lead 08, and this was joint work done with Joe Tuchek, Anthony Kazi, Chris Greer, Wei Hong Jiang, and, and Yang Yan Zhao. And then finally, for the details of, of how we defend against this potential threat, you can see our blue chip paper from Oakland 10, which was joint work done with, with Murph Finnecum, another one of my students at UIUC, and a few of my colleagues, uh, Milo Martin and Jonathan Smith from Penn. So to conclude, the, the basic theme of this talk is thinking about how to protect lower layers in our computer system. You know, there are, there are many trade-offs where you have higher level applications, so it might be where more vulnerabilities are happening. But the more damaging attacks, and albeit the more rare attacks, are happening at the low layers. So we have two different ideas on how to protect the lower layers of our computer system. 
One is we want to modify the operating system and build a new one to try to make more secure web browsers. And the second one is blue chip, where we try to identify and remove potentially malicious hardware automatically. So this is the actual conclusion in the end of the talk. Uh, are there any further questions? Yeah. So, so about the identifying uh, malicious uh, logic in, in hardware, so any uh, of this kind of work, it would be uh, one would want to know what's a false positive and false negative, right? Yeah. So how, how can you evaluate that? So false negatives are notoriously difficult to, to evaluate, and we don't really have a good answer for that. Um, you know, my hunch, so the way I look at, at UCI, the, the basic algorithm, is it's a first cut at this general type of thinking about security and variance in hardware. And, um, you know, it may or may not end up standing the test of time. Uh, you know, is it, is it sound? Is, you know, is it going to detect all attacks? I, I don't know. Um, false positives are actually pretty easy. So false positives, blue chip handles those. So if you have circuits and they're not, and you identify it and it's not part of the attack, that's okay. You know, the blue chip system will recover. And I've got lots and lots of performance results in, in the paper, but on average it adds like maybe 3% overhead. It, it, doesn't ha it doesn't occur very often. So do you actually detect, the, for example, the, the malicious attack that you did in your previous work? Yeah, or? De definitely. We, we definitely detect our own. Um, so, at least for, for attacks that are known in the public domain, we, we detect those uh, without question. In fact, you know, those were the attacks that really helped us build up the intuition into, into the problem. Um, so those we detect, you know, is there an attack out there that's going to get around UCI? I don't know. Maybe. Probably. So the, 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 the intuition is uh, um, running through all your attack uh, specification, the malicious logic will not uh, the, what they are evaluating will not change. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so it's 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 a very common pattern that we used when we were building malicious hardware. Whether it's the only pattern remains to be seen, but it's certainly a very common way to think about doing it. Yeah. I don't have a button, push, so it's not. I'll all repeat the question. Um, so. Sure. Uh, okay, yep. Uh, and he was talking about the work that they had done for uh, SEL for mm -hmm. verifying. And for that, for 8,000 lines of code, they have hundreds of thousands of lines of code. Yeah, I know, I know. And 20 years so, to do so it, I realize this. 42,000 might be quite a bit of work. But um, based on that, my, my other question was. Well, so I, I guess I have a comment to your comment. Um, uh, instead of answering a question with a question. Uh, so I, I would say that, that we have already done some work formally verifying the API. So for some of our previous browser work, we, we modeled the overall API and model checked it, and we found bugs in our implementation. So you know, I think that there are many, many different levels of, of formal verification. You know, are we going to fully formally verify IBOSS kernel? No, probably not. We don't have 20 man years for 8,000 lines of code. However, we're, we're, I'm fairly confident there are many, many very significant things we can do, um, and, the, and our key approach is going to be to pick the parts of the system that we think are most complex and most security critical and really focus on those. So I, 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 I hear what you're saying, but I think we can make more progress than you might think is, is initially possible. Sort of. So that's, that's a tough question. So it was kind of it was surprising. So, um, you know, one of the interesting things that I didn't really mention here is that the first title of the paper was, uh, was Performance, Trust, and Protection. And I, like we thought, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll use this um, microkernel approach and we've got message passing and, and multi-core system. We're going to throttle people on performance. So we'll, we'll be the fastest browser out there. Turns out that wasn't the case. So we're still in the process of, of debugging the performance, but what we think is happening is not really the, the, the message passing is okay. Because um, if you look at our performance results in the paper, you can see the comparison between IBOS Linux and, and IBOS, where you know, we're still using message passing in both, but IBOS Linux is <clears throat> a little bit faster than IBOS. What we think we were seeing is spin lock contention on the IPC channel. 
So we're not 100% sure what's going on yet, but we think that it's part of, uh, related to the SMP implementation that we were using.